want to get at it, but I do want to set up some background here. Um, we do want to talk about uh, Canto 18 still. We were still uh, discussing it when we had to break off last time. And so I will come back to that. But the major figures, of course, in the second half of the Purgatorio are, the, the new ones are Statius and uh, Beatrice herself. And that's, uh, along with Virgil, these are the major personalities that have dominated the first two canticles uh, of the Commedia. So we want to think very deeply about what it means to have these figures show up and, and what role they play. Uh, just like the appearance of Cato at the very beginning of the Purgatorio, we are very surprised by what Dante does with the emergence of uh, Statius on the scene. And that happens in um, 22, Canto 22. This poet is one of the, he's being added basically to that number we saw in Limbo. We had Homer there, we had Horace and um, uh, uh, oh, now I'm blanking. Lucan and Ovid um, and Virgil himself. And now we've got Statius, who was a, let's see, he, his years are 45, AD 45 to 96. He flourished um, under Domitian, Emperor Domitian, who was one of the, the Flavians. Uh, his father was Vespasian. Uh, and his, old, his brother Titus was the one who preceded him as emperor. Um, so Statius and Domitian has the um, notoriety of being, according to Christian sources, the, the second emperor to persecute Christians. And that's disputed by some historians, but that seems to be the best way to account for the conditions surrounding the book of Revelation uh, that, that John the Apostle would have been writing in the 90s while um, when the Emperor Domitian had started his uh, persecuting activity against the Christians. So what we have, so I just want to note some things about Statius that uh, are important for us to understand, and then a few things from the poem just to have in our minds. So Publius Papinius Statius, or Statius, uh, is known for one uh, great epic poem, The Thebiad, and I, I spent a lot of last week finally getting around to reading the thing, and I th it was very important, I think, to do that because Hollander and a lot of others try to, to ferret out why it is that Statius would be um, chosen by uh, Dante as being plausibly a Christian, because, of course, we have no other indication from any source that Statius ever became a Christian. It's not likely at all. Um, because the, the members of the senatorial class or those who were near the emperor, they did not convert to Christianity in the first century. That wasn't, that's not what happened. Uh, it took a few centuries. Obviously, it was very slow growth, and then the, it, it was exponential, but slow at first. And then, obviously, in the years leading up to Constantine in the early 300s, um, the exponential numbers started to really kick in, and that's that's part of what Emperor Constantine would have been dealing with is the fact that Christianity was at that point growing rapidly, but it was not so at the beginning uh, at all. So Dante is doing something by, by uh, fabricating the notion of Statius as Christianity. And part of the question we have to have in our mind is why? Um, why would he think it's plausible? But grammatically, this seems to give um, much cause for reflection when it comes to the role of Virgil. Remember, as the three of them are proceeding up the upper uh, terraces of purgatory, we have one poet that we presume to be damned, Virgil. We have one who uh, has been released in this fanfare. Remember, this is the one person we see on the Mount of Purgatory who's actually completed his penance and is now uh, able to ascend to the stars. And he's holding back because he wants to accompany his great teacher, Virgil. So Virgil is the mama, actually, is the word that's used by both Statius and um, Dante as his, he's the great um, nurturing mother for these two other poets. 
so that's very moving and it's, it's, it, it raises the questions we've been thinking about all along. Why would one poet be saved and not the other? And so we, we want to have that in our mind. Uh, as far as why it is that uh, Bethebiad might uh, have some indications that of Christianity, I, and this is something I haven't found in the literature yet, I haven't done enough of a survey, but it's good for me to do this publicly, just in case I'm the first one to find it, and it's on record. Um, there's, in the account we have in, in Canto 21, we have, um, sorry, it's 22, where, where Statius is talking about why it is that uh, he was led to Christianity by Virgil, right? This is the, the very, not only is Dante presenting us this dramatic contrast between Virgil and Statius, he's, he's saying that through Statius, Statius became a Christian because of Virgil, of, because of the fourth eclogue, which was known in the early, by early Christians and by medieval Christians as being a prophecy of the coming of Christ. It's, um, and, and this supposedly worked on Statius. And so it caused him to uh, start to talk to the Christians that were around at the time. And there were some, obviously, in Rome. Um, because Paul wrote his letter to the Romans several decades before this. There was a small Christian community in Rome from, from the early days. Um, in Canto 22, uh, line 88, Statius says, I was baptized before in my verses in the Thebiad. I had led the Greeks to the rivers of Thebes, but from fear I stayed a secret Christian. So that um, the work, the Thebiad, is about the seven against Thebes. If you've seen the Magnificent Seven or... There's a lot of riffs off this um, this mythological theme. Uh, when Ed part of the curse of Oedipus is that his two sons, uh, Polynices and Antiochus, they they can't uh, share rule of Thebes, so they decide to alternate years, and Antiochus reneges on the deal, and so um, uh, Polynices brings an army from the Peloponnesian uh, area of of Greece. The, uh, Argos and then then allied cities and they they march on Thebes. The all uh, six of the seven are killed except for King Adrastus of, of Argos. Uh, the war doesn't start until book seven so the, the poem moves very um, deliberately one might say. So Statius is saying that whatever you're going to find in the, or Dante the poet is telling us that whatever clues you're going to find in the Thebid, Thebid for the uh, Christianity, the crypto-Christianity of um, Statius, you're not going to find it before book seven. I find it in book 10. There's this character named Anetius, who is the son of uh, Creon. Uh, the, other, the other one, Haman, obviously shows up in, in Sophocles' play. But uh, Anetius, uh, because of a prophecy of Tiresias and his daughter Manto, and we've seen both of those figures in hell, uh, he's told that if he sacrifices himself, then the city of Thebes will be saved. So he sacrifices himself. And he says things like this, uh, one earthborn man must sacrifice for all. Uh, the people proclaimed him savior, king of peace, a god. And it, it, it's, it's, very, it's very powerful. And, and actually the, the setup is that um, virtue, this allegorical figure of virtue descends from heaven and uh, fills uh, Manetius with this um, self-sacrificial desire to, to sacrifice for his people. And then there's another passage. Pius Manetius, though, stood on the walls in a selected spot. He's, his face seemed holy, his presence more august than usual, as if he had been suddenly sent down from heaven to earth. As if he had been suddenly sent down from heaven to earth. He took his helmet off, so he was manifest, so he was known, and gazed at this disharmony of men. He drew attention from the noise of war, and then commanded silence on the field. And this is before he commits his suicide that would save the people. So that's my theory anyway, is it's very Christic. Um, this is clearly a mythological figuration that's, that has all the Christological markings. Um, so I believe that this is what Dante the poet found and was able to say, yeah, this, this is a guy, I don't think he actually believed this station. He knows he's creating a fantasy, but uh, so. We have a question there of the use of allegory again. Allegory becomes very prominent in this poet, Statius, and he's read throughout the Middle Ages. He was actually a very popular poet. Um, 
up and through throughout the medieval time, and it was read allegorically. So this is part of the background of, of how uh, epic is going to be done by a Christian writer in the Middle Ages. So we left the uh, two pilgrim, the two uh, travelers on the terrace of sloth, which that's the that's one of the the sin that is directed towards a good, but directed in a way with defective love, not enough love. Uh, in the medieval literature, it's talked about as acedia. Uh, there's a lot to think about with that particular sin. It's, it has a lot in common. It looks a lot like melancholy or depression. That's not really the way it's done here in this poem. It seems to really have a, uh, its focus in. One is just not energetic in carrying out the projects that one should be carrying out filling one's mission, one's vocation, and so on. The next level up is the uh, Terrace of uh, Avarice. And in that terrace, we meet the first Pope, I believe, that gets actually uh, saved. All the others up to this point are, are damned. Um, and that's, that's a Pope named Adrian V. And then we get on up to the next Terrace of um, well, actually, along with that, with Adrian, we have this uh, very important figure, uh, Hugh Capet. And that's going to be important because um, Dante is winding up to give a very um, uh, powerful uh, assault against the French monarchy, which had so much to do with his undoing as a, uh, as a citizen of Florence. Um, the cadet branch of the uh, Capetian dynasty, which, which ranged from the nine, late 900s all the way up until the early 1300s, actually. The Capetian line would only um, die out, would die out uh, a couple of decades, a decade um, and a half after Dante's death. He didn't get to see that, which would have pleased him. It was actually the transition from the Capetian to the Valois uh, dynasties that, that sparked the um, Hundred Years' War with England. Uh, under the Capetians, France was able to become a very powerful monarchy. Uh, so, and there were very complicated relations with England there because a lot of the English started off as the Norman, um, so they were vassals of the French crown. And they continued to own land in the south of France, the uh, Anjou and, and other places. Eventually, under the Capetians, all of that got consolidated including more and more the southern areas of France around Provence, uh, but not completely. So one of the things Dante is seeing unfold at the beginning of the 1300s is the uh, disaster that's enveloping the papacy, which is going to, in 1309, uh, Clement V uh, takes the um, papal court to Avignon and would not return, the papacy would not return to Rome for until 1378. So that, that Avignon um, papacy, the Babylonian captivity of the church, was a devastating um, blow to the credibility of, of, of papal um, authority. And, it had, and then it was followed up a couple of years later with the, uh, the great papal schism in which two and then eventually three uh, anti-popes would be, or three uh, claimants of the papal throne would be vying with each other, and that wouldn't be settled until the Council of Constance, or the Council of Constance, which then put another factor, and that was the question of whether a council should rule the church. And, and these things, in the end, would, would destroy the um, um, the world, the, the, the worldly influence of the church. Um, it, was, it was all downhill from there. So, uh, when Hugh Capet shows up, therefore, in the uh, in the Divine Comedy, it's it's a very uh, striking moment because uh, this this is a, a figure who's going to be important for Dante's life because in the end there's a an Angevin prince Charles of Valois who goes into Florence in late 1301 and gives cover to the Black Guelphs who in the end destroy the Whites uh, and that is why. Um, Dante is going to be exiled. So uh, Hugh talks about why that this entire history of the French monarchy gets uh, corrupted by, by avarice, as indeed uh, the papacy does. So that's, that's another historical background. And in the end, in the final um, dumb show, the pageant of the church uh, militant, when you see that giant who's 
next to the the whore of Babylon, that's that giant is is the French monarchy, right? Because um, Philip the Fair, ironically named Philip the uh, Fourth, is the one who um, who beat uh, had uh, Boniface VIII, even though um, Dante had no love for the man because Boniface VIII was one of the key uh, figures in his exile. But that Angevin uh, alliance backfired on the Pope because in the end, the uh, a rival Roman family, the Colonna, which was uh, warring with the Caetani, which, uh, to which Boniface belonged, the Colonna and a, a member of the French uh, court kidnap, uh, kidnapped Boniface and then beat him and he died a few um, weeks later. So. Uh, Dante unequivocally condemns this action, even though he's become a neo ghibelline of some sort, he condemns this action completely, even though Boniface VIII ends up in hell, right? Um, because, so this is the, the kind of subtlety of Dante's position is that he doesn't believe that imperial power or secular power should trump the church's power. He believes that both are, they need to be on the scene and they need to basically check each other. I think that's, um, that is his final position. I think within that he's also um, very little our Republican actually. That's that's a point that's somewhat disputed, but I'm gonna cite the one passage where when uh, they get to the top of the steps uh, on Mount Purgatory, one of the greatest passages in all of literature uh, indicates a very Republican kind of sentiment. But above the level of Terrace of Avarice, you've got the Terrace of Gluttony, and then you've got the Terrace finally of lust. And uh, there are things to note there. Um, uh, when one can say that the treatment of homosexuality here is different than the treatment of it in Inferno, and that's something to think about. Uh, this has something to do, I believe, with the first dream um, in the uh, canticle, which we want to talk about, uh, which is you. where uh, Dante becomes um, Ganymede, and so that's a pederastic kind of attack on the part of uh, Jupiter. And I, I believe that that's part of the story here, but I don't want to get too speculative about the thing. In any case, uh, the homosexuals that we see in hell are the noblest people we see in hell. And then um, homosexuality here is treated along with every other sexual sin on the highest terrace, which I think is probably useful for, for Christians to kind of keep in mind because there's all these other sins, which really are, in fact, no matter how you slice it, much, much more serious. And it's worth, I think, kind of having um, Dante's vision uh, to help balance one's passions. Um, Statius is the one who will give us an account of how it is that there can be bodies that can be tortured, even though um, these are all dead souls. And that's what we see in Purgatorio 25, an account of how of medieval embryology, uh, medieval Aristotelian embryology of how all the, um, the blood gets digested four times and eventually has the power to form a new person um, and, and so on. And when you take away the body at death, then what you've got is a soul that still wants to form something and forms the air around itself. And that's, that's the thing that allows God to um, inflict suffering on on these, um, those who are damned and those who are penitent. So that's, that's interesting too. So they go up through the flame on the terrace of uh, lust, which is, um, Dante doesn't, he's so afraid of fire. And uh, it is worth keeping in mind that in fact, he had one of the death sentences that he'd been given from Florence was to be burned if, uh, at the stake if he were ever to show up in. Uh, Florence again. So on page 607, this is Canto 27, and line, I just want to read this, the, 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 a couple of lines. We'll probably have to come back to it, but I just don't want to miss it. Um, Virgil has, has led his charge all the way up to the top of the mountain. It's the highest point of purgatory because um, it seems to be an embankment around the top and, and the Garden of Eden is, is a little lower down. So once they take the top step, they, they're at the highest point on earth. And, and Virgil's the one who's done this, right? And um, he's done it by his 
ingenuity, that is his poetic wit and his skill, his art, actually it's emphasized in, in line 30, 130. And he says, I've, I've led you through the eternal fire and the temporal fire. You be, your will has been corrected. And then line 133, look at the sun shining before you. You're looking on the Garden of Eden, right? Look at the sun shining before you. Look at the fresh grasses, flowers, and trees, which here the earth produces of itself. You may sit down or move among these until the fair eyes come, rejoicing, which weeping bid me come to you. That's Beatrice. No longer wait for word or sign from me. Your will is free, upright, and sound. Not to act as it chooses is unworthy. Over yourself I crown and mitre you. Truly some of the most stirring words in all history, frankly. So if you take a man with his uh, Dante's commitments, where he, he believes in the imperial power, the crown, and he believes in the um, episcopal power, the papal power, the mitre, but he's saying in, underneath all of that is the fact that we've got an individual human person who, whose will ought to be so in tune with reality that if you find something delightful, you can do it in complete liberty. And, and that's, what, um, that's what God has always wanted. And so this, this pagan poet is saying, uh, I crown and mitre you. That is, you, you become pope and emperor over your life if you've become virtuous. It's very, very nice. So they go into the Garden of Eden. They meet this, um, this unnamed woman who only gets named very far late in the game, Matilda. I'm not gonna get into, I don't have a pet theory yet about, um, about who she, she is, but um, we have these two women at the top, right? Um, Matilda, who, who is going to baptize um, uh, Dante in the rivers Lethe and Unoe, which are completely, to put Lethe up in uh, Eden is a complete innovation. And then he just creates another um, river out of whole cloth. Um, and then of course the whole thing leads up to this, this immense, um, it's astonishing, the pageant of the church triumphant. And after you see the books of the Old Testament parading by behind the seven candelabra, which come from the book of revelation and those represent the holy spirit and trailing the rainbows in, that, that stay in the air i mean it's it's a remarkable s cinematic um, vision you have the theological virtues and the uh, cardinal virtues playing around uh, 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 in front of the triumphal chariot and you have the griffin that is uh, jesus christ who's pulling the, the chariot and then all of a sudden a hundred angels show up and in the middle after all that build up, the person who shows is Beatrice. It, it's one of the most shocking moments in literature. And we have to think about it. What, what could it mean? First, you would think, uh, maybe this might be Mary, maybe it might be Christ, but you build up like that, it's got to be somebody at the center of salvation history. Well, Dante the poet is saying she is at the center of salvation history for him. And part of what he's implying is that every person has someone like this, someone who is God's providence meant for you. And he will say somehow it's going to be romantic for some. I don't think he's committed to saying that for everybody. I mean, he's clearly, he loves Virgil and Virgil could have been that person. Uh, and was that person say, if Statius would have his triumphal um, procession, Statius could be in that, uh, Virgil could be in the cart for him, which is actually one of the points I wanna keep pressing. But it's Beatrice, the great love that he had lost, according to the timing of this poem, 10 years before she died in 1290. The poem happens in 1300. And she's the one who completes his um, penitence. And so I'm going to kind of leave it. I'm going to wrap up very soon. We'll talk about that pageant. After the, the, most of the members of the, the church triumphant ascend, reascend into heaven, what we're left with is the chariot. Uh, the, the, the chariot axle, which is going to represent the cross, and tied to uh, against the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then we're going to get a, uh, a history uh, of the church militant, a very sad history of imperial um, donation of power, uh, corruption of the church from inside and outside, and then finally the last one being the French um, corruption of the church. And uh, 
it's it's an astonishing achievement to to, to get the whole scope of, of what history has been laying out in terms of the um, what has happened to the great plan that God had um, put into motion for the sake of the salvation of every human. So there's a mission that's implied here. That's really important. We see that very clearly. Beatrice is saying, you've got a mission. And actually, it's not just Dante. It's every human who reads this poem is being given a mission by, by Beatrice. So I'm going to leave it at that. Um, the questions are, I don't want to read through all of them, but they are good questions. So I do want to, um, James did very well in sending them out because that, in highlighting them in that, in that way. But the dreams are very important. Uh, talking about some of the exemplar, exemplar that we see on each terrace, that is we get the three that are not, not always three, but uh, a few examples of the virtue that is the antidote for the vice. And then we get three examples of the vice. Uh, we have a further discussion of avarice. avarice. Uh, Dante knows that this is a real problem. Uh, then we have the ranking of sins. That's worth thinking about. I alluded to uh, what does it take to become truly free as human beings. Um, Virgil's departure uh, is, is very moving, and we would want to look at that. And then, of course, uh, Beatrice's role. Uh, one final thing I'd like to say that the question was asked, David, I think, asked um, last time about indulgences, and I looked that up. Uh, it seems that the, the notion of applying an indulgence for a dead person was not officially, um, not part of the official church teaching at this time. It was, though, apparently in popular um, uh, practice already. Dante is using the, the first plenary indulgence that was granted for a jubilee year was done by his enemy, Boniface VIII, in, in, this, in the year 1300. That was the first one. The history of the plenary indulgence goes back to the beginning of the preaching of crusades um, in the late 11th century. That is, if you went in, um, on a crusade, you would get a plenary indulgence, and that, but that was only for oneself. So an indulgence basically is a way of taking graces that are connect, usually normally given through the sacrament of penance. They are somewhat divorced. Well, in the Middle Ages, they were divorced. It's, it's an extra sacramental way of getting remission of temporal punishment. The sacrament of uh, penance, supposedly, it, the, the, uh, the belief is that you turn. it causes a turning back to God. A turning away from God by mortal sin is, a, is death to one's soul. Turning back is uh, reestablishes the relationship and that's the uh, remedy for the guilt, the culpa, that also takes away the eternal punishment that, that results because to be apart from God, away from God, is, is to be damned. That's what it is. But then the temporal punishment has to do with one's conversion towards temporal goods, and that, that has to be worked off in some way. So I'll just leave it at that. I could go in farther, but...